Welcome to your Property Rights Podcast, proudly brought to you by Private Property. If you're looking for expert legal answers to all your property-related questions, then stay tuned. A warm welcome. It is another episode of your Property Rights Podcast. And good day, good day from Paul Rotherham, proudly brought to you by Private Property. Silna Stain, by the way, is the MD of SSLR Incorporated Attorneys with a national footprint. She is our expert when it comes to property law, specifically focusing on rentals and evictions, which leads us very nicely into today's question. Hi, private property. I bought a house for 35,000 Rand from my neighbor. We went to the police station together and signed an affidavit. Then, when I tried to move in, There were people already staying in the house. They wouldn't leave. So I spoke to a lawyer who told me the house is not mine and doesn't belong to me. I've paid a lot of money for this house. Please, can you help? Sure, this is a desperate, desperate story um, and a very sad message to read here at Private Property. So, but thank you for sending this through. Let's see if we can, in, in fact, help. Oh, Paul, this is a devastatingly sad question. And the reason why it's so sad for me is I see this way more often than I would like to. As a property lawyer, I think I do understand a bit better and I have a bit more empathy with um, people asking these kind of questions. And I, I really hope that with this podcast, we can get this answer out there so people understand property ownership and the transfer of ownership of immovable property just a little bit better. So where this is coming from and why there is such big confusion in all of this. If we look at the very complex history of South Africa, for a very big portion of our history, a lot of people, by far the majority of the country, were just not allowed to own immovable property. We had those long-term leases, but that wasn't property ownership in the true sense of the word. And obviously, if you haven't owned property, you haven't lived in a house that your parents owned, you didn't see property transfer as you were growing up, I have a lot of empathy with this question, and I'm so grateful that we get the opportunity to answer this question. So why property ownership and transfer of immovable property is such a complex thing is because it's super counterintuitive. We are used to buying things. You walk into a shop, you take a Coke off the shelf, you pay for it, and now it's yours. You can drink it, you can pour it out next to the road, whatever. It is yours. This is not the case with immovable property. With immovable property, we follow... A, a very particular system that was that we adopted into the South African law from the Dutch law system. Remember, our legal system is based on the Roman Dutch law system, and this is a Dutch law element of that. And I want to add at this point that our immovable property transfer system is, in fact, one of the best in the world because we record it very specifically. We record in our deeds office the diagrams that is done by your town planner or your land surveyor and then for every earth that the town planner sets out and the land surveyor then draws onto the diagram we have something issued called a title deed now a title deed is really just a piece of paper but it's a pretty important piece of paper that piece of paper says this earth with this earth number. So it's not an address per se, but it obviously your earth number links to your address. And it's just the way we, we record it in the deeds office. A title deed is one title deed is issued per earth. And that title deed will always remain the same title deed for that earth forever and ever, which is why to this day in our deeds offices. We still have very old title deeds. Some of them I recently heard still recorded on on pig skin, a really massively old uh, pieces of information. And then you just change the name of the owner, but not by crossing it out with a ruler and rewriting the new name. It has to go through a process. And this process is called the transfer process. The only person that's allowed to do this is a conveyancer. So a conveyancer is uh, an attorney that's specialized in a slightly different angle. 
you write a special different exam, which is called the conveyancing exam. And then you have to approach the high court like you have to, to get admitted as an attorney or an advocate or a notary for that matter. Exactly the same way, approach a court, ask them if you may be enrolled as a conveyancer. And once the court says it's cool, you may be a conveyancer. You are the only person who are allowed then to transfer property on behalf of another person. So unfortunately, to go to the police office and do an affidavit, that might in a way sort of replace the role that um, an offer to purchase, a sale agreement, those are all the same things. That might replace that part of the transaction. But until you instruct a conveyancer, which you're going to find now at a, a law firm typically, until you instruct a conveyancer to transfer the property from the owner to the purchaser, so a transfer from the seller to the purchaser, so the registrar of deeds will consider this application, let's call it that, and the deeds registrar will then say, okay, I am satisfied that all the requirements was met. I am satisfied that this seller paid all these rates and taxes. I am happy that we can now transfer the property to the purchaser. And then there is a process that happens and it is recorded as such in the deeds office. That data is then widely available and it's public available information. Um, it's one of those pieces of information, uh, personal information that is in fact not overly protected by um, POPI, the Protection of uh, Personal Information Act. So we can all access the deed of deeds office data without bridging any other legislation. So when I do an eviction, as now let's put me back in my eviction shoes, if I do an eviction, I have to do a deed search through, there's, there's quite a lot of systems that allow you to do deed searches. And I have to confirm in the deeds office that the person owning the property, the person wanting to do the eviction, is in fact the owner of the property. And in this particular case, unfortunately, our listener isn't because an affidavit at the police station would not fulfill that requirement to transfer the property from the previous owner, the seller, to the purchaser. And for that reason, this listener is in fact not the owner of the property and for that reason won't be able to evict the people in the property legally because he's not the owner and that is one of the most important things to prove when you do an eviction. So unfortunately, this property wasn't transferred to the purchaser at all. It's almost a scam, isn't it, Silna? And I'm not suggesting that in this case it was an intentional scam. You might very well have people who are just simply ignorant. They're not fully aware of the process. Just a question here, and it does concern me somewhat. Surely, at a point, if you are signing an affidavit at a police station, one would think that the police themselves would have an understanding of the legal process and say, well, hang on a minute here. Unfortunately, signing an affidavit is not sufficient to transfer a property. What can be done about that? Is there anything or not? Unfortunately, remember, the police in that role wasn't acting in the, um, as the police per se. They were acting as commissioners of oath. So remember, a commission of oath is um, any attorney, any accountant, and then police officers and a few other people are commissioners of oath as well. I am obviously then also a commissioner of oath. I know very often the heads of schools yes. are commissioner of oaths. They have a stamp and they can assist you with verifying ID documents and so forth. Exactly. Just something that's good to know if ever you do need a commissioner of oath stamp and you live near a school. It's a handy thing to know. But as a commissioner, you're not authenticating the content of the document. You're authenticating that the person signing this affidavit is in fact that person. So you ask for the ID so you can confirm. You tell the person, please just drop your mask a little so I can confirm that you are in fact this person. And a commissioner of oaths only confirm that the person who signed is in fact that person. So the content of the affidavit is completely irrelevant in the hands of the police. So the police won't 
won't consider that, they probably will not even read it because they don't have to. Even when I commission a document, I never read the content because it's irrelevant. I just need to confirm it's this person. And I think that's exactly the problem because people believe they've done this at the police. Actually, you haven't. You could have gone to the uh, principal of the school, as, as you rightly said, Paul, and that wouldn't feel as... Um, legally binding to go to a school as it would to the police station but I'm very glad you used that um, because that makes the point if you go to any other co uh, commissioner of oaths to do this it would feel suddenly it feels more okay this is potentially not the way we transfer property. Unfortunately then Silna here on the private property uh, property rights podcast am I correct in assuming that at the very least, what could happen here is the person who has spent the 35,000 Rand on a house, at the very least, they could approach the person they paid that money to and potentially open a case of fraud of some sort. Um, but in terms of property law itself, this isn't really a property law question per se. This now becomes almost a, a criminal activity. Yes, if it was intentionally. But what I see with these kind of matters Usually it's not. It's not, there is no intention of defrauding the other party. If there is, definitely go to the police, open a case of fraud, and then um, it will be prosecuted uh, by the state. However, if it was an accidental uh, oversight due to, to bona fide ignorance, my answer would be go to a law clinic or a legal aid or, or the lawyer that advised you previously, but definitely a conveyancer. Take that affidavit because we can definitely use the content of the affidavit to bring it into a sale agreement. We do a formal sales transaction. We change that affidavit to a sales agreement, an offer to purchase, where both parties sign because in terms of the Alienation of Land Act, an offer to purchase Immovable property must be in writing and signed by both parties. If that's not the case, we're not even ticking the first box when it comes to property sales. So that has to be done in a specific form, it must be done in writing, signed by both parties, and then we can get to the transfer process. So I'm really hoping, and, and I do believe in this case, that we can still help this um, listener out by giving this advice to go to a conveyancer, you can still transfer after the fact. Money was already paid, so luckily that part of the transaction is already done. Now both parties just need to sign the transfer documents. We need to obtain clearance figures from the municipality. We approach the deeds office. The registrar of deeds is happy with everything. We transfer the property. And then if those people are still in the property, good news for the listener, we can most definitely evict them because now you are the owner of the property they are in the illegal occupation we can get the eviction and hopefully get you moved into that property yay well fantastic there might be a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and a happy ending to the story i certainly hope that is the case silna and that this isn't an intentional case we mustn't overlook that where unfortunately somebody may have been duped because obviously if the property is not yours to begin with if you don't hold the title deeds you cannot be running around um, selling the property and I, I know we've all read of stories where that's happened I've read stories where the same house has been sold multiple times or rented out multiple times to loads of different people who have all paid deposits and large sums of money only for this just to be a criminal activity. As always, Silna Stain, the MD of SSLR Incorporated Attorneys. Uh, there's, there's no question that you are an expert when it comes to property law, Silna. So thank you very much for answering that so well. I'm even feeling a little nervous for this poor person because, I mean, 35,000 Rand for many people is, is probably almost your life savings. So I really, truly hope that this story does have a happy ending. And please let us know, just as you can, in the comments section, if you'd like to join in the conversation for your property rights podcast, proudly brought to you by Private Property. We would love to see what you have to say, and we'd love to join in that conversation with you. Stay close and be sure to join us for our next episode coming soon. Your property rights podcast is proudly brought to you by Private Property. Leave a comment or ask a question to join the conversation.